uh, my name's Chris, I'm one of the leaders here, and it's good to see um, some friends and uh, some new folk here as well. And also good to welcome everyone who comes usually. It's great to see you, it's really good. Um, last week, if you were here last week, not everyone was here last week, but last week, uh, Chrissy um, gave a really powerful uh, sermon about how Christ dealt with all our sin on the cross. And uh, just, just up here, there's a, there's a cross of nails. And that, that cross of nails was done many years ago. And each person in the church here had a nail. And they put it into the shape of a cross on a, a board. And then one of the members of the church welded it all together. And it's up there. And that, that, that cross that is, is there as a, as a sign that uh, our sins are nailed to the cross. And they've been dealt with. And it was very powerful because each one of us put one of those nails up there. And the, the verse, the main verse that, that Chrissy used was from Colossians 2, verse 13. And it says this, When you are dead in your sins, when you were dead in your sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. <laughs> having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Because sin separates us from God, doesn't it? Sin separates us from God, it leads to death and destruction. These verses from Colossians 2 verse 13, it's kind of a legal language. The debt that we owe is a, a, a legal debt to God, but we, it's a debt for our sin. But when we accept Jesus, when we come to Jesus, the, the Bible says, those words say, God makes us alive in Christ. He forgave all our sins. All our sins. We're forgiven. Isn't that amazing? Just if you were here last week, just remember that again. If you weren't here, just hear it again today. We're forgiven. He forgave all our sins. And we're made new in Jesus. All our sins are forgiven and we're made new in Jesus. So then, how are we to live? Going forward, our sins have been forgiven. How are we to live? And that's what I'm going to look at uh, just this morning. So, if you've got a Bible, if you want to turn to Colossians chapter 3. So, Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 uh, through to 17. So Colossians chapter 3, uh, starting at verse 1 through to 17. And it says this. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, 
but our love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach, admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. So those, those first few verses then in, uh, in uh, Colossians, verses 1 to 3, talks about when we become a Christian, we are made new in Jesus. Verse 3, for you died, it says, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Christ is in us. God no longer condemns us because he sees Christ in us, pure and holy no sin. He sees Christ, not our wretched sin. Verse 1, it says this, it says, so we have been raised with Christ. So if we have been raised with Christ, we need a change of heart and a whole new mindset. That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. We need a whole new change of heart and a whole new mindset about the way we think. In fact, Paul goes on to say, we need a completely new wardrobe of clothes. That's good news, isn't it? <laughs> and see some of you excited by that. Go home, tell your husbands, <laughs> tell your wives, we need a new wardrobe of clothes. We've got to throw out uh, the um, tatty old ones and dress ourselves in new beautiful clothes. Now I don't know about you um, but uh, well do you have a favourite pair of pyjamas or old clothes that you have to a few nods? I've got uh, I, well, I can't even call them a pair because I've got a tatty sort of pair of jogging <laughs> bottoms and a top that doesn't really match but I love them and they're really comfy and they're a bit frayed and I don't really want to throw them away because they're really cosy and they're warm and then I just want to go to bed and get, uh, you know what I mean, don't you? You're with me. You've probably got some like that, probably not as tatty as mine. But, um, but when I get dressed in the morning, I don't put my clothes on top of my tatty old pyjamas, I have to take them off. And we have to take the old off to put the new on. Verse 5 says this, it says, put to death therefore, put to death therefore whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then there's a whole list of stuff. Put to death, Paul says, put it to death. That's a very strong language. The verb suggests that we don't simply like put it in a cage and bring it out occasionally. It's actually put to death. Like stab it till it dies. Um, it reminds me, it remind, when I was looking at this, it reminded me of what Jesus said in Matthew 18, verses 8 to 9. He said this, very strong language again. He said, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. What is that? Listen to that language. Can you imagine doing that? Gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Sin still causes a problem. Christ has dealt with it, but sin still causes a problem. It gets in the way. We are new people. We need to put these things to death. Similarly, verse 8, you must get rid, you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. And Paul goes on to say, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. 
We have to throw out those old clothes, those old habits that we might have. Don't just fold them up, put them back under the pillow so you can put them on again when the first sign of challenge or stress comes. I guess the real question is how? How do we do that? Paul is using really positive language here. He's saying, you know, you've got to, not, it's not positive in the sense that it's uh, healthy, but it's like, just get rid of these things. He's like, put it to death. Rid yourselves. Now, imagine, just for a moment, that you really love chocolate. Some of you are not finding that quite so hard as others. Easy to imagine. Right, now imagine you're trying to stop eating it, right? You're not going to eat it anymore. And that's difficult, isn't it? I, I, okay. But we know that it's more difficult to resist temptation if you've got a secret store in the kitchen or beside your bed or wherever it is your secret store of chocolate might be for those weak moments. We know it's more difficult to resist, don't we? You know that, obviously. It reminds, there was a story, uh, it's not a true story, but it's just an illustration, a story that I heard uh, years ago, and it's always stuck with me, about a, a little boy who's, uh, I don't know how he wasn't that little, but a boy who, who his parents said they could go and, you could go and play uh, down the bottom of the garden uh, in this place, but there was a, a, a river at the bottom, but he wasn't to go and swim in the river because it was too dangerous. He could go and play, but not to swim. And then one day the little boy came back and his hair was all wet and he had a wet towel and a wet swimming costume. And his dad said to him, have you been swimming in a river? And he said, yeah. He said, I thought you told you not to do that. He said, well, you did, but the sun was out and it was warm and sunny and I had my costume with me. He said, why did you have your costume with you? He said, well, in case I was tempted to go swimming. <laughs> and we're a bit like that, aren't we? I think we're a bit like that. And there was a survey of Christians, and um, uh, and, and, it, and, and when they, they surveyed Christians, they said, um, when are you most likely to succumb to temptation? And they said, well, when I'm tired, when I'm bored, when I haven't spent much time with God in prayer or in the Bible. Those are the times when we, we give in to those things that we don't want to. I think when we're looking at these things, there's a few things that I think we need to do. One is we need to be honest with ourselves when we're looking at sin in our lives. Be honest. You know, God sees it, doesn't he? We sometimes like, try and compartmentalise it off. No one else will see it. But God sees it. We need to be honest with ourselves whether any of these things are, are an issue for us. Find out what your triggers are. When do you fall into sin? When, when, when is that a problem? And we need to be proactive as well. We need to, uh, to try and get upstream. Don't, don't take your swimming costume with you. Right? You know, don't keep your chocolate in the cupboard. Just mainly talking to blokes here, but if it's porn you struggle with, put to death those opportunities to sin. Just if it's your phone that's a problem, take off the browser. Don't, don't, don't have that incognito thing where you can look at stuff without anybody else knowing. Put a password on that says Jesus is here when you come to it on your laptop or whatever it is. Benjamin Franklin said this, he said, it's easier to suppress the first desire than to satisfy all that follow. And we know that's true, don't we? Once we, you know, the biggest lie ever is that uh, it just once won't harm. Just once. It'll be all right. The same principle applies to any of these things. If it's anger, if you get angry, well, identify your triggers. Don't put yourself in those situations. Get lots of sleep. Don't be irritated. What comes out of our mouth, Paul says, Slander, filthy language, moaning about others. It's the same principle. We need to be honest with ourselves. Where do we fall down? Be proactive. How can we get upstream and stop, us, stop ourselves getting into those positions? Be accountable. Tell someone. 
Tell someone you're trying to tackle this. Get them to pray with you and get them to ask you from time to time, how are you doing? Because that makes a huge difference. Is it going to be easy? No, I don't reckon it is. Are we going to achieve perfection? Never going to sin? No, I don't think the Bible teaches that. If you, we look in different places in the Bible and it, you know, it, there's a battle going on. I love, um, I love the story Charles Spurgeon, I think it's a story about Charles Spurgeon, uh, who was, um, he met someone who said he was no longer sinning. His old self had died. The old man had died. He had a new life, so he didn't sin anymore. And he rabbited on about this for ages. And Charles Spurgeon, he was sitting at the meal table. He got fed up with him, talking about how sinless this guy, how sinless he was, and how perfect he was, and how Christ had dealt with it all, and it was all done, and he never, never sinned. So Charles Spurgeon, he took his glass of water, and he chucked it at the man. <laughs> I won't play it. <laughs> we, do, we don't need to go into that full dose. And the man got really angry and he swore at Charles Spurgeon. And Charles said, uh, Spurgeon said this, he said, Ah, just as I thought, the old man wasn't dead. He'd merely fainted and could be revived with a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to be perfect, are we? I, 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 we know that. In fact, in, in, in Romans 7, Paul says of himself, he says, I, do not, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate, I do. There's something inherent in us that Paul does, isn't it? Paul says this, for I have the desire to do what is good. We all do that, don't we? We've got a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do. This I keep on doing. There's something about human nature in here, isn't there? But Paul, being Paul, he's also got the answer, hasn't he? Verse 24, Romans 7, verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's Jesus that can help us. We're not alone in this battle. We're not alone when we put to death, when we try and put to death those feelings and that, uh, that, that Paul talks about, and the sexual immorality and thoughts and the greed and the idolatry and the anger and the malice and the slander and the moaning. We're not alone. Christ is with us. The new life of obedience, fortunately, does not depend on our own moral resolve that comes from being united with Christ. It says, doesn't it, those verses, that we are, our lives are hidden with Christ. Christ is in us, we're in Christ. Verse nine, you have taken off your old self. You have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed. Your new self is being renewed. So Jesus is with us in this, helping us renew our self. It's being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. We are being renewed. So, be honest. Be proactive. Be accountable. Be with Jesus. Those are the four things that I want you to take away. Verse 12. Let's just have a look at verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. You are God's chosen people. Did you know that? God has chosen you and he's paid a price for you, which was Jesus' life. He's chosen you. We're holy. We're made right because of Jesus through Christ. We're dearly loved. He loves you so much. Fantastic. Therefore, as God's people, holy and dearly loved, what are we to do? We want to please him, don't we? We want to serve him. What's he asking us to do? Clothe yourselves. That's a positive action, isn't it? You don't just happen to get dressed. You have to physically do that. We've got rid of those old clothes. But now we have these beautiful new ones to put on. Who goes out to buy a whole new wardrobe? A 
and then never puts those clothes on. It doesn't happen, does it? We get excited when we buy a new clothes. We get excited and we want to wear them. And people say, oh, you look great in that. So we need to clothe ourselves with our new wardrobe, with compassion. To clothe ourselves with compassion is to see things with empathy and understanding. To do that, it involves actually spending time with people and actually listening, actively listening, seeking to understand their experiences, their perspectives, what's going on. I was very struck by um, my Chrissy's friends that came a few weeks ago, Jen and Matt. They used to invite folk round to their dinner table and they had, you know, maybe from half a dozen to up to 40 folk come along. But what they did was, and some of the core group that met, they always used to ask the people that came, how is your day today? How are you getting on? And they listened. They were about actively listening. They were clothing, they were physically clothing themselves with compassion. They wanted to understand where people were and what was going on in their lives so that they could pray for them, so that they could empathise with them, so that they could sow in words of scripture and, and just support them in love. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience not always easy is it but we have like it's a choice that we make it reminds me it's echoes of um, the the fruits of the spirit which we see in galatians 5 isn't it in there fruits of the spirit you know, love joy peace patience kindness self-control and they come from being uh we produce fruit when we're attached to jesus when we're with jesus when we're on his vine that's our fruit how are we doing for time? A few more minutes. Verse 13. Let me just share this. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Has someone upset you already today? Don't know. Maybe they have. Maybe it was yesterday. Maybe it was last week. Maybe it was last month. Maybe it was even last year and you're still holding on to that grievance. Uh, have you got a grievance against someone? I'm tempted to say good. I'm tempted to say good because it means you've got the opportunity today to go and put this sermon into action. If you've got that in your heart, if you've got something against somebody, you've fallen out, you've had a bad word, you've moaned about someone, you've got a grievance. Paul says, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. When, we, uh, when someone upsets us, we can choose to take offence, can't we? We choose to take offence or not. We can hold on to a grievance or we can forgive it. It's not easy, but remember Jesus is with you in this. He wants to change us. I was at the um, uh, rugby match last Saturday. I was at the rugby match yesterday as well. Um, that's, that's my rugby done for a year now. Um, but last, last Saturday, I went to the rugby uh, when England were playing Australia. And I went with Mark Datsun from uh, the 11.30 service. And while we were there, we bought a couple of pints of beer, because that's what you do at rugby. And uh, Mark said, shall I carry your beer for you? And I said, yeah, that'd be great, because I was on a little mobility scooter. And he's walking along with these pints of beer, and someone comes up to him, and just like there's 80,000 people walking around, a knocking. What happens, what happens out of his cup? Like the beer comes out. What comes out of the cup? Well, it's beer, isn't it? Because that's what's in it. Like if it was coffee, oh, oops, sorry about that. coffee would come out of it. If it was tea, tea, it was beer. Beer comes out. And when we get knocked, when we get upset, when someone is going to barge into your life, what comes out is what's inside. What comes out is what's inside. It's no surprise, is it, that beer comes out. What comes out is what's inside. Is it anger, rage, filthy language, slander? Or is it compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience? 
What's inside us is what comes out when we have these bumps in life, when someone cuts you up on the, on the road, you know, whatever it is. When someone in church says something that upsets you. So Paul says, look, just forgive. And, it, and that, that's powerful imagery here, isn't it? Because wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it just be great if every Christian did what was said here? Those of us, well, all of you will know that Sometimes there's tensions between people and people fall out and a lot of sometimes in leadership, you know, we're trying to deal with people and like, oh, I'm going to say, go and read Colossians, go and read Colossians 3. <laughs> Bear with each other and forgive each other. If any of you has a grievance, forgive, why has the Lord forgave you? And then Paul wraps it up, verse 14, and over all these things, put on love. Which binds them all together. Put on love, which binds them all together. It's like that. Uh, I don't know. You ladies, you so, I'm not, blokes aren't so good at this, but you know, you put on a scarf, don't you, that, that matches the, the flex in your skirt and brings together the earrings. And, you know, I just put on a shirt and a pair of trousers and hope that they match. But there's some often there's something a little something that binds all your clothes together that makes you look even more beautiful than you are. And that's what Paul's saying here. Let's put on love. Just clothe yourselves in love. If you clothe yourself in love, you know, you can't be angry with people, can you? You can't do all those other things. What goes in is what comes out when we get upset. So, here's, here's what I'm asking you to do. Be honest. When we're looking at this passage again, there's stuff in here which probably... You, you're not good at if you're like me you're sinful there's stuff that you do wrong be honest be proactive how can i get upstream and stop doing that is there a way that i can try and uh, ask jesus to help me be, be be accountable maybe if you're struggling with something in particular share that with someone so, you know it's, it's really helpful just to, to meet and pray and say, look, I'm really struggling with this. Can you, can you pray for me? Can you ask me in a couple of weeks how I'm getting on? Because it will make a difference. And then fourthly, be with Jesus. Be with Jesus, because we can't do any of this on our own. You know, we, there's some stuff Paul is telling us to do things, to clothe ourselves, to rid ourselves of these things and clothe ourselves with new things. But we've got, we're not going to do it on our own. We've got to do it with Jesus. And as we... Spend time with Jesus, and he'll work in us and through us and change us from the inside out. So when you get knocked, what comes out is Jesus and not our old self. Let me just pray. But when we read a passage like this, we know that you're speaking to us because we recognise some of these traits in ourselves that we like going back. Or maybe, Lord, we want to change and we struggle and we can't. We find that, not that we can't, but we, we just keep getting drawn back. Lord, I pray now for anyone struggling with a particular issue, Lord, that you would break into their lives. You would show them what it is and show them a way forward. Lord, I thank you that you have dealt with all our sin on the cross and you deal with all our future sin. But that doesn't mean to say we should keep on sinning. By no means. Help us, Lord. And help us to put on those new clothes. What can I do that's going to be good today? What, can I do? what good thing can I do today? Where can I show someone some kindness, compassion, love? Help me, Lord. So, Lord, just keep bringing these things to mind in this coming week by your Spirit. That we might be moulded into your image, constantly being renewed. Lord, help us. We can't do it on our own. We know with you, you can make that difference. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.